He is also a contributing editor at Art Forum, an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail, and has contributed to numerous museum publications, including exhibition catalogs published by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, LACMA, the Guggenheim, and the National Gallery of Singapore. In 2023 to 2024, she was part of the inaugural cohort of Ford Foundation Scholars in Residence at the Museum of Modern Art. And with that, I would like to welcome to the stage Joan Key. Joan, welcome to Ask Me May. Well, first off, thank you very much, Catherine, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm just very sorry that my dear friend Ai Kong could join us today. I heard her mother just passed, so our thoughts are with her at this uh, time. Uh, but uh, the first question I wanted to bring up is to think about what would it look like to have an art history that accounted for more of the world rather than less? so that what we get is an art history that uh, really prioritizes abundance rather than gatekeeping and scarcity. So this is where Afro-Asia comes in. And uh, where does Afro-Asia come from? So when we think about Afro-Asia in a historical context, the map or the image that most often comes to mind is this map. So this is of the Asian African Conference, which was held in 1955. So 10 years after World War II, and it was the first large-scale event that brought all of the newly independent states from Africa and Asia together, which you see by all of the shaded areas. It took place in Bandung in Indonesia, so not a likely site for a, a large-scale international conference. And these are all the countries of the world that... Uh, for lack of a better uh, phrase, I looked a little askance at some of the Cold War rivalries brewing between the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. So two things that we uh, may, might want to keep in mind was the Asian African Conference. So these are all newly independent states that were asking themselves, what direction do we want to align ourselves with? What kinds of forms of cooperation can we establish? And then the third, perhaps, question to keep in mind is that all of the shaded countries represented 60% of the world's population in 1955. So in other words, most of the world, uh, rather than, again, uh, less. Now, the map that perhaps now articulates how we think about modern and contemporary art echoes what we see right here. So this is a simplified view of the Brandt line. So the Brandt line uh, refers to a line that was draw, imagined for a report com commissioned by the World Bank called North-South, a program for survival. Uh, as the name suggests, this was a report commissioned by the former West German Prime Minister, Willy Brandt. And the entire report was looking at the world through the more developed countries and the less developed countries. So this is the way, one of the ways in which we think about questions such as the global north, so every, all the countries north of this line, and the global south, all of the countries south of this line. Now, one of the questions, though, that arises is this, well, two questions. One is that it really stresses a concept of development based on industrialization, you know, uh, GDP, per capita income, you know, numbers, you know, quantities, figures. The other is that it really just cuts through the world. So in other words, this is a map that's based about what sort of divisions, what kinds of, say, hierarchies or competitions can we think about, can we think through when we think about the world. Now, with Afro-Asia, I want to instead maybe have us look at a different kind of map. So this is a map designed by the Japanese artist Hachime Narukawa. Uh, it was first uh, designed in 1999. And what you see here is a, a revised version. Now, Narukawa was very much interested in is why is it that all the maps in the world don't really show the world as it is? So the typical Mercator projection, which was developed in the 16th century, again, you have a north, south, uh, east, and west. And it doesn't really show the ratio between landmass to ocean in an accurate way. 
Now, with Narukawa's map, uh, so he was someone who studied with uh, the US uh, uh, designer Buckminster Fuller. And he was very much interested in geometries, in shapes. So rather than start with a flat map, he wanted to start out with a sphere, the globe, which was then divided into multiple sections and then eventually becomes the map that you see uh, on the right. So this would be uh, a more accurate projection. Two things we might notice about this map. One is a whole lot of ocean. In fact, the ocean, that, that is central to the map. It's not the continents. In fact, uh, land masses only account for something like 30% of uh, the surface area of the world. Uh, the second is there is no, again, set direction. You know, so ideas such as uh, you know, Far East or Middle East or even West Asia, you know, terms that are very familiar to us when we think about geography don't really hold when we think about something like this, where, again, the United States is tilted in a certain way. Uh, the continent of Africa is much larger than it nor what normally appears on a globe. I was just in the museum store looking at the uh, rotating, uh, glowing globe, and I was just thinking, wow, Africa looks really small in that globe versus here. This is not to say that this is a perfect map. Those of you who have been to Brazil, you've been thinking, um, this, that's, that's, you've got to work with this in, in, a, in a different way. All of this is basically just to say is when we think about Afro-Asia, it really is a call to think about the world from a variety of different perspectives. That the world itself is really just kind of a, a moving set of coordinates. And one of the first coordinates that I did want to think about is this pairing right here, which is something, uh, to my knowledge, is never shown together. Because in, especially when, again, in, especially in this very, uh, in the climate in which we live, we tend to think about race in a very sort of particular way. But I wanted to think about, again, emissaries that were sent from Africa to Europe or from Japan to Europe. So on the left is a painting by the Flemish painter Jasper Bex. It's called Don Miguel de Castro, Emissary of Congo. So this is actually a diplomat that was sent by a Congolese kingdom. So he, this is a work that, that's made in 1643. In 1643, the Dutch had uh, secured uh, territory, control of a territory that roughly corresponds to present-day Angola on the western coast of Africa. And for, them to, for the Dutch to do that, they needed the help of this guy's boss. Now, this guy's boss had some issues with other kingdoms in the Congo area. And so Dom Miguel was dispatched via Brazil. Because Brazil at this time, part of it, there was a small uh, portion in northeastern of Brazil called Dutch Brazil. So he was dispatched via Brazil and then eventually to the Netherlands to plead the case of his boss to say, hey, you know, Dutch people, we helped you get some territory. Now you're going to have to, you know, it's, it's time for payback. So this, the, so I'm bringing him up here because one, to really stress the idea of, again, different bodies having different kinds of trajectories that are not just conditioned by one narrative. Now, on the right uh, is a painting by Archita Ricci, and this is a portrait of Hasekura, Hasekura uh, Tsunenaga. Now, Hasekura, like Don Miguel, had a boss. So Hasekura was, was a samurai. So he was of the military nobility class that also belonged to the ruling class uh, of Japan. And those of you who are Japanese art, histori art, his uh, art historical buffs, you'll notice the date, 1615. So this is just at the beginning of the Tokugawa era. So Tokugawa, shogun, kind of a, a sort of the main ruler in Japan, dispatches this guy because his boss said, you know what, go and negotiate some trade relationships uh, with European powers. Now, Hasakura goes from Japan to Manila to Acapulco. States knocked to Acapulco because, again, that's... Back in the days before a Boeing 747, he's on a ship, so he has to stay for a few months. From Acapulco, he makes his way to Spain, to France, eventually to present-day Italy. 
And Pope Paul V commissions this portrait of him. And one of the things you might notice is the ship, right? So again, these are, this is someone that's really on the move. And you might also notice his, uh, his attire, right? So this is, again, not, quote unquote, a traditional kimono, but this is a form of attire that has got, undergone multiple kinds of alterations. So in some ways, how is it that both uh, Hasakura, but also Don Miguel, represent a different kind of movement than perhaps what we might be used to when we think about you know, colonization or uh, exploration or uh, the spread of uh, cultures around the world. Uh, let's see. Now, moving back to Asia, so here are two portraits, and they both feature the same figure. And uh, he's standing in the, in the same position, right? So these are both what uh, are called miniature paintings, N not because they're really that miniature. I mean, it's what, 12 by uh, you know, 8 inches and 15 by 10. It's not miniature per se, but rather how is it that these images fit within, say, the format of uh, a handheld book? This, his name is Malik Ambar. Now, Malik Ambar was born in what is present-day Ethiopia, I think the border between Ethiopia and Somalia, and he was sold into slavery. Now, but his trajectory, his, so as a slave, he was brought to India. When he gets to India, he becomes a military genius. He's able to raise a giant army of mercenaries, and he can take on the Mughal dynasty. So eventually he becomes, he rises to the level of prime minister in what is uh, present day in the Deccan region. So he's someone that is uh, commemorated extensively in, uh, among artists in Deccan in the southwestern, uh, southwestern uh, uh, area of India. And uh, you also might notice that uh, you know, his dress, for example. So this is all very much specific to that region you know, with his sword and uh, again, He's not really pictured with any other you know, figures. He's in isolation. So thinking about how is it that Malik Ambar becomes a subject of veneration. Now, thinking about not only bodies, but also images or things or uh, other non-human forms of life that also travel. Because when we think about Afro-Asia, we also want to think about how is it that oftentimes things and ideas travel more quickly than people. Now, on the left, so this is roughly from 1700. It's in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Uh, even at the Rijksmuseum, they're not quite sure where this is from. Most likely, it was taken from either a royal residence or from an aristocratic residence. So it's a tile panel that's very loosely based on Chinese uh, hanging scroll painting. So long, th narrow, thin format and also the way that the figures are organized. So when we think about Chinese painting, uh, spatial depth, or rather spatial distance, uh, tends to be commensurate to the bottom edge and your eye moves along to the top. And so that's, you see figures kind of moving into the distance. Now, a couple of things I think uh, that uh, many of you have probably already noticed is, what are, what's that? I mean, this is supposed to be you know, nominally uh, based on you know, Chinese painting, although there are references to Buddhism with the Guanyin figure that you see here. It's really kind of a, a melange of figures. The black figures that you see here, those are based on other painted representations of indigenous Brazilians. Because again, this is from, uh, this is uh, 18th century from the Dutch. This is just after the Dutch lose control over Dutch Brazil. So what, so again, looping back to some of the uh, questions we've been discussing, so how is it that in some ways this is kind of an imagined scene of two very, very different cultures coexisting in the same panel? So in other words, how is it that art allows us to imagine geographies that politics perhaps might not be so amenable to, uh, or politics might not allow us to do so easily? On the right, uh, because I'm obsessed with um, animals and everything zoological. Uh, so this is a woodblock print from Ichirusai Yoshitoyo. 
So it's called Recently Imported Big Elephant. Surprisingly, this is not the first elephant to be depicted in Japanese art. Uh, the first documented, I, now I'm going off on a tangent, but uh, again, I love elephants, is the first uh, elephant to allegedly come to Japan. That was in the early 15th century. Back then, it was considered au courant to, again, gift elephants to, you know, to, uh, 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 to, to, to the shogun. Um, there's also a wonderful uh, incident in which the elephant suffered so much in Japan and also because he apparently knocked over some of the shogun's officials that the elephant was then re-gifted to the Korean king. <laughs> the Korean king didn't want it either because he said, you know what, I, one, it, 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 it's eating all, the, the, all our crops, we're in a famine, I'll just send it to some island. And uh, the last known record is apparently the elephant was extremely emaciated, but uh, um, no record of that elephant exists after that. Anyway, tangent. 18, so this is 1863. So this is kind of the tail end of the Tokugawa era. And uh, we notice that the elephant is just kind of taking up all the room, clearly eating up house and home at this time. Uh, you have a woman in, again, big corset, uh, tons of crinoline petticoats. So this is a woman that stands in for the foreign presence that's based in Yokohama near Tokyo. So Yokohama is, the, is a, a big port that had been opened up to foreign trade. And here she is kind of looking, sort of thinking, um, I'm not going to get in the way of that one. And uh, again, you also have uh, foreign sold, uh, military, but you also, again, have a black figure, a black attendant here. Now, one of the things you might also have noticed is the ears. So they're big, they're floppy. This is an African elephant. It's not an Asian elephant with those small little uh, that sort of like piddly ears. This is a big floppy ears. Now, this is almost assuredly an imagined scene, but one that also gets us thinking about how is it that, again, the convergence of cultures or bodies or people that you would might ordinarily think as being just very, very far apart, in fact, are just really crammed together here because of this elephant. Uh, the other thing that's really great also about this image, too, is how it just really crowds out the human. I mean, that, uh, that poor guy, I really, uh, this woman, uh, this child right here, that it really sets up an interesting animal versus human tension as well, which you don't see in other depictions of elephants in Japanese woodblock prints, and there are a lot. Now, moving towards uh, to this time to Canada. Um, so I'm from Michigan, and I live in Detroit. So Canada is, in fact, um, south of Detroit. So this is uh, always thinking about how is it that geography is itself an unfixed proposition has been very interesting. Now, Francis Fitzroy Dixon uh, was born in what is uh, currently Sri Lanka. Uh, his uh, father and grandfather were both uh, of the British uh, Navy. And uh, this is a watercolor that uh, he made called Asia and Africa. Well, Asia and Africa were often paired as abstractions, uh, usually in the service of, uh, say, thinking about both continents as places that are uninhabited, places uh, that are sort of uh, raw territory, uh, places perhaps that needed to be conquered. And you know that's present here too, because again, you have Africa. You, it looks like it's completely uninhabited. And also Asia right here. And we're, we're kind of meant to identify with this little ship right in the middle. Now, but I also want to think a little bit too about how is it that Dixon is also thinking about these two continents as being close together. So in other words, how is it that the idea of traveling, I mean, we don't know for sure what, you know, what this ship, what, you know, if it's up to any no good, we don't know that. But uh, the fact that we think about these continents as, again, you know, not being sort of set in stone, not being fixed, and that you have this vast, vast body of water. Right? So one, thinking of, thinking of places like Asia and Africa as you know, something that uh, is, you know, they're, they're floating. They're not, say, necessarily uh, set in stone. Now, this time going to the United States. So these are two uh, works uh, that are in the collection of the MFA Boston, which uh, has a very well-known collection of Asian art. 
Uh, but on the left, and I'm bringing up these two works here because I'm also thinking about how artists, too, were joined because of an interest in learning from different parts of the world. So on the left is a work by uh, Duen Fang. Uh, Duen Fang was a very high-ranking official. He was Manchu, so he wasn't Chinese. So he was a Manchu official in the kind of the waning years of the Qing Empire. So those of you who are Sinologists know that the Qing Empire ends in 1910. Uh, Duen Fang was very prominent in educational reform, but he was also the first Manchu official to systematically collect foreign objects. So Duen Fang actually is able to travel to Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he makes something like, uh, estimated like six or 700 uh, ink rubbings of, uh, again, steles, hieroglyphs, uh, other sort of uh, Egyptian inscriptions. And he uses uh, the technique of ink rubbing that we uh, often associate with Chinese art. So you, know, you apply a, a, a moistened uh, piece of paper to a hard surface, and then you uh, rub ink over it. Now, a couple of things to notice here, though, is that you have the calligraphy that coexists with the hieroglyphs. So for Duen Fang, he's not seeing this as a straightforward, oh, I'm going to make an ink rubbing so I can record the fact that this, these hieroglyphs existed. I also want to think about this as how can this also ground the possibility of a different kind of a set of cultural connections? Uh, one other thing to also think about with uh, ink rubbing, too, is that it's, it's kind of a sensual medium because it not only picks up all of the little cracks and residues and fissures of the original stone, but uh, the ink itself kind of competes with the hardness of the stone. And it's both a mixture of wet and dry. And so this is just one of uh, many uh, rubbings that he did. And uh, this seemed to be a fitting companion to the work that we see on the right by the African-American artist, Louise uh, Milo Jones. Now, Milo Jones is very, very well known for some of her other or larger, tend to be very colorful paintings, uh, especially of Haiti. But uh, not so much, in fact, uh, practically nothing is written about the fact that she looked at painting through what she was able to engage with in terms of the Asian art collection at the MFA Boston. So she went to Boston before she went to Paris. And one example is this watercolor from 1924 called Chinese Embroidery. So it's based on a piece of embroidery in the museum's collection. Again, embroidery, say thread, you know, needle, textiles. The tactility is very, very much apparent. Any, any of the, I, I mean, I cross-stitch um, you know, on the plane. So again, that kind of tactility is very central to any kind of sort of uh, uh, form of sewing. And that's also something she brings into this watercolor, which is, again, a di much, an entirely different medium. But one of the things that you see here is that how is it that Melo Jones is also trying she doesn't think of Chinese embroidery as something to be copied, but rather, how does it perhaps attain a different kind of life or an extended life through painting? So one of the other questions that I think Jones is also getting at is, what is the tension between one medium versus that of another? Now, we also think about um, Afro-Asia through the lens of war. So moving to... This uh, work uh, that is a it's a man's under kimono. So it's an undergarment that's worn underneath a, um, a, a sort of a, a kind of overcoat, uh, an item of clothing that has a kind of overcoat-like function, and it's called Italy in Ethiopia. One of the things you might notice is uh, yeah the flags, right? So these are all flags of uh, uh, Italy. It, uh, uh, was it Italian Africa? So Italy invades Ethiopia in 1935, and it's roundly condemned by the League of Nations, saying, you know, you, you just can't march into a country and try to take it over. But the Japanese government was thinking, no, you know what? We finally found uh, you know, a, a, a companion because the Japanese in 1932, when they invade Manchuria, which is on the Asian, the Chinese mainland they get condemned and then they're thinking, well, we're not the only ones. I mean, look at you know, Italy, they, you know, they, they go up and doing the same thing. 
So these Italy and Ethiopia symbols become just, again, it, it becomes the rage. I'm just uh, showing you um, only my favorite of the examples, but you see it on you know, packaging, you see it on textiles, you see it in magazines. And then uh, here, for example, you see all of the soldiers right here. You see uh, uh, you're literally wearing uh, bomber planes on your body. So one of the other sort of questions, too, is how do we also think about what sort of pairings or convergences Afro-Asia makes possible? Now, uh, perhaps moving to maybe slightly more um, uh, positive uh, ends is uh, a work that was made just before the end of World War II. And uh, we talked a little bit about, again, uh, Japanese imperialism. Now, this is another take on that same subject through the work of William H. Johnson. So black American artist uh, known for paintings that uh, resonate with uh, collaging techniques. So what you see right here is a page from one of his extensive scrapbooks. And you notice that there are different figures that are paired together. Now, the figures themselves often take their cue from uh, news articles, for example. And uh, this particular grouping is interesting because this is a grouping that refers to a very well-known 1942 meeting between Gandhi, Chiang Kai-shek, and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. And this was a meeting where uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who was then the leader of Free China, asked Gandhi for help to resist the Japanese. So giving pride of place to this particular assembly, when you notice uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek is wearing a very snazzy patterned outfit. So this is something that was actually based on a spread that was published in Life magazine. So one of the questions here is also thinking about how is it that Afro-Asia base, is based on or spotlights like in different kinds of assemblies that don't necessarily have to go through Europe or the United States. Now, going back to this particular map. So one of the questions that Johnson gets uh, really kind of brings to the fore is that question of anti-imperialism or inde national independence, which is something that comes to a head with the Asian African Conference, well, commonly known as the Afro-Asia Conference. And uh, you might also notice that there are some key omissions. You know, Korea is not there. Uh, uh, Sierra Leone is not there, even though it's independent. So one of the other sort of questions with this map, too, is also thinking about, well, who doesn't necessarily agree to having these kinds of political alignments? Uh, here is uh, one of the maps that was uh, basically posted all around the city of Bandung, almost like a billboard that showed all of the different countries that were represented. Uh, and it says uh, on the right, uh, Betchak. So it's like a, 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 not necessarily a push card, it's like a, a buggy. So buggy driver reads one of the conference posters in Bandung in Indonesia. And this was published in the Asian African Conference Bulletin in 1955. And I'm bringing this up here, too, for us to maybe speculate a little bit about, rather than think about a post-war art history that sets 1945 as kind of the, the beginning, what about 1955? You know, what other countries might then have uh, get more visibility or become uh, have more, a bigger place? Now, on that note, so we talked a little bit, again, about maybe the tension between art and politics. And this is also something that becomes a, a little bit of a subtext with uh, this work by two, at that time, young artists, uh, Wu Biduan and Jin Xiangyi, called uh, Chairman Mao Standing with People of Asia, Africa, and Latin America from 1960. Uh, this is a work that is uh, currently in Beijing. It's a, it's a fairly big work. It's about five, uh, you know, five by five feet. And uh, all of the so-called third world, and guess who is at the center? Yes, Mao. Mao has to be at the center because this is 1960. Mao has no friends because he's, all, he's quarreled with his Soviet buddies. And uh, the US, no, that's not going to happen either. So how do you then reclaim a certain place in an international world order? One of the things Mao uh, realizes uh, straight away is that 
he has to start making friends with all the other countries that, uh, again, are skeptical of either US or Soviet uh, 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 authority. What's also interesting, though, because all socialist realist painting, and by that I mean a certain kind of approach to depiction that's figurative, that looks uh, lifelike, everything has a purpose. Most of these paintings were painted through committee, meaning that a committee would gather and say, OK, this is what should be, uh, what should be featured. And so some of these works were painted over and over again. One of the things you notice is a uh, woman in a kimono right here, right in the middle. This was very, very deliberate because this 1960, this is when China and Japan resumed trade relations. So one of the interesting things about this formation, too, is that as Mao is quite aggressively courting heads of state of African countries, you also have Japan in the middle, again, underwriting part of that enterprise. Now, speaking of uh, aggressive courting of uh, countries, so on the right, uh, workers in Brazzaville in the Congo from 1967, and uh, again, lots of uh, workers seemingly venerating these portraits of Mao. So China invests very heavily in, uh, in the Congo. But then on the left, uh, again, leaders from Tanzania come to Beijing, and you know, they, they get a reciprocal treatment in a way that they probably wouldn't have gotten in, say, US, United States or Europe. So another sort of question that arises here is, yeah, how do we think of the fact that both these images probably re represent more people of the world, just in terms of you know, sh sheer numbers, than, say, some of the other ways in which we think about uh, post-war contemporary art history that tends to, again, you see the same, you know, the same artists or the same movements can something like this start reshuffling the deck a little bit? Now, speaking of the United States, on the left, we have Kathleen Cleaver, uh, then a member of the Black Panthers. And this is a photograph that was taken of her in Berkeley in California, just uh, up the coast, from 1968, which seems to be everyone's favorite year when it comes to modern contemporary art. And here she is looking absolutely stunning. Um, this is someone that really uh, understands viscerally the power of visual acuity and how you present yourself. And then in the back, you see these posters. They're kind of hazy. They're sort of blurred. But these are both posters. On the left is a poster that, again, uh, is supporting Vietnam at this time. And on the right is the poster here in full color by Cao Yuchung called Firmly Support U.S. Black People's Just Struggle Against Racial Discrimination from 1963. 1963 was the year that Mao gave a very, very famous speech about how is it that the U.S. civil rights struggle was a human rights struggle that should also include again, everyone from all, of, all parts of the world. And so this is a poster that was reproduced not only in China, but also readily available in the United States. So one of the sort of questions that we also think about is that with the Black Panthers, that it really stressed self-determination for black communities. But that self-determination, too, again, was also scaffolded by an understanding of how that, that struggle was really a global struggle. Now, Switching yet again, because Afro-Asia, if nothing, is just about constant reattunements and reorientations. So we saw Kathleen Cleaver, again, smoking with uh, the two posters in the back. And now we have a work by the French photographer Marc Rebou of his then wife, Barbara Trace Rebou. Now, Barbara Trace Rebou was one of the only uh, US citizens to be able to travel to Beijing before the Cultural Revolution. And uh, here he is. Uh, again, um, I, you know, I never trust poorly dressed artists sometimes. It's like you know, something like this just you know, fitted. Just the, the, the fabulosity is, you know, is, is glaringly apparent. And here she is in the Forbidden City in Beijing, just ringed by all of these uh, you know, fairly bemused uh, revolutionaries. Right? Just, uh, some one day I always wanted to write a paper about this guy because you know, he knows that something is just something's up. And uh, you know, here she is just, uh, again, kind of almost holding court in a way. But uh, Barbara Chase Rebu talks about her time in China, even now, even quite extensively. And one of the most memorable of her experiences 
was uh, being able to travel in Mongolia. So here's another Ribu photograph. So um, there she is in the back, and here's her uh, quote unquote minder in the front. And uh, some of the things that they see include uh, steelies, so S T E L E, so usually referring to upright, uh, so these sort of look like pillars. You're, they're usually markers to indicate that a village or a community once stood in a particular space or a roadway. And this kind of uprightness, it's something that she talks about uh, in her poetry, but also in her recollections about why even going to Mongolia was such a turning point. You know, this is also true with someone like Martin Purrier, that uh, the, the idea of the yurt in Mongolia, kind of the collapsible, portable uh, habitat used by nomadic peoples in the area was also kind of a real sort of, uh, maybe not reality check, but kind of a, a switch. Now, that uprightness, you know, this is something that we also see in Chase Rabu's work, such as The Cape from 1973. Uh, this is the uh, most recent uh, a presentation of it at MoMA. And uh, you notice that uh, this cape right here, it's all made up, with, made up of what appears on first glance to be dog tags kind of knitted together. Now, these are all flattened, uh, uh, sort of uh, almost like... Um, uh, tags or small squares. And the reference to that is this jade burial suit. So this jade burial suit was is from the Western Han Dynasty. And it was discovered in Hubei province in 1973. This discovery of this suit was the archaeological find. So if you, even if you Google, go to uh, old newspapers from 1973 and Google archaeology, Reproductions of this suit is what you'll find. And this is something, again, that strikes a chord with Chase Rabu. So even though that this is kind of horizontal right here, it's, it's not the same because you know, Chase Rabu is not interested in replication. She's interested in how does my work allow myself to cut across histories that maybe you know, universities or people like me would say, oh, this Asian, African-American art, they're totally separate. Chase Rubu said, well, no, 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 no. Let's yeah, behold my work. So one of these sorts of questions that uh, uh, there she is right here is to, and again, think about how these works kind of unsettle some of the received ideas about which artists or which artworks go in which section or which uh, subdiscipline. Now, it also worked the other way around. Uh, Pang Nae Hyun is a Korean artist. So she is uh, arguably Korea's best known uh, professional woman artist of mid-century. Uh, she's someone who got her bearings in the 1920s. In 1963, she goes to Egypt and Ghana. And that has this kind of a similar effect as Barbara Chase Rabu going to China. She makes literally hundreds of these drawings. Now, these are of Ashanti Combs. Uh, so uh, every uh, drawing that she makes is very much uh, invested in replicating the pattern. And this is something that also starts to filter back into some of her printmaking, as we see on the right, right here. So thinking about line linearity. And it's not linearity that's derived from ink painting. Pang Nae Hyun started out as, as a quote unquote uh, uh, you know, ink painter. But uh, there is something about what she encountered during her travels to Egypt and Ghana that made her take a very different direction. So this is a color on paper work uh, from 1960, roughly, uh, probably executed in 1967. But um, uh, what is it? The owner of this work insists you have to put 1966, so I did. <laughs> It's called Glory, and to see the work, I mean, this is quite muted because it's blown up on a, a digital screen, but to see it in person, the, the vermilion is very, very bright, for example, that uh, even the, all of these figures, oh, sorry, all of these uh, forms are created through the dilution of ink and water. They also are a, an attempt for Pang Nehan to, again, think about how is it that her encounter with, say, Ashanti Combs in some ways, in almost sort of uh, made her have to relearn painting anew. Now, there's um, one of the things that I'm uh, very struck by is look, reading a little bit into Bantu philosophy. So Bantu, uh, a loose term referring to the language that 40% of uh, uh, inhabitants on the African continent speak, 
And there's a very key phrase that uh, really uh, insists that you only can know something through something else. And so is that the philosophy that Pang Nehyun is applying to her own work? Now, again, so more sort of uh, looking at, again, uh, reflective looking. So here we have a, uh, a set of, uh, so these are all pages from an article written by the Igbo, uh, Nigerian artist Obiura Udechku. And the article itself is called Uli and Li, Aspects of Igbo and Chinese Drawing and Painting. And it was published in Nigeria Magazine from 1981. Now, Udechuku was someone who was very much interested in is looking at Uli decoration. So this is a approach to depiction that's been in Nigeria for again, centuries. It's usually enacted by women on the bodies or sometimes on the exterior of a home. And so here you have, again, different, say, configurations of line. And he was very much interested in thinking about Uli through the lens of Chinese painting. Udechiku had seen many examples of Chinese and specifically Song Dynasty painting. And I, you know, he lives in Carson in California, so not maybe about four hours from here. And I once told him, well, actually, the, I think the painting you would really like is Qing Dynasty, because that's when weirdness starts happening in full, uh, in, in, in full force. But uh, this particular article is really kind of thinking about how, does, how do you estrange yourself from the familiar? You know, how do you kind of think about what it is that you've been doing for so long so that you kind of reclaim some of the spontaneity you may have lost because you're so, you know, these sorts of uh, uh, manipulations of line, they come as second nature for, some like, for someone like Udechku and does say Song Dynasty painting offer a kind of very useful friction to push against saying, well, yeah, that's one way to look at line, but what about looking at line and also unmarked space? So one of the hallmarks of ink painting is the interplay between marked space and unmarked space. How do we, again, uh, you know, mess it up a little bit? So these are two other pages right here. Um, I, I mean, I have to say the examples he chose are very, you can't get anything more sort of uh, uh, far flung in some ways. So you have a, uh, was it, uh, uh, you know, Ma Yuan painting right here, and then you also, he was very much also interested in calligraphy. So how is it that the, the way that calligraphy kind of primes your hand to write in a certain sequence, how does that also then affect the way in which he's thinking about uh, line drawing in his own work? So this is a work from 1989, so a more recent uh, work that he did called Mirror, Mirror. It's an ink wash on paper. So in other words, using roughly the uh, analogous materials that you would see in Chinese ink painting. And one of the two things, well, three things. One is, the, again, that interplay between space that is defined versus space that is left em uh, open or empty. And for him, empty space isn't uh, kind of, it's not passive. He's really thinking about how is it that this unmarked space can interplay with all of the other sorts of marks that he's made right here. So these are all little people uh, kind of clustered, sort of gathering below. So he's not a straightforward abstract you know, artist, even though sometimes he's associated with abstraction. And then sort of in the middle is that very kind of thick wash. Right? So this big kind of line right here and this sort of a you know, middle component and he's made sure to dilute that ink so that it just starts to almost kind of uh, uh, disintegrate into tiny little fractal-like points. So one of the questions that Udechku is really interested in is how in one work can you uh, engage with multiple scales so that your eye becomes very sort of narrowly focused on these little people right here, and then you also have to contend with this huge mass at the same time. So how do you inject a sense of dynamism to a work that you would uh, presumably think is a still object. Now, uh, so I, have to, I guess I have to talk about the, the, you know, why I put this on the cover of my book. So this is Howardina Pindell, um, and it's a, a work called Autobiography East-West Gardens from 1983. Now, Pindell had gone to Japan twice. The second time, she stayed about seven months, so a much longer time. It wasn't a happy time, necessarily. Uh, she talks at great length about uh, 
again, being the subject of you know, ridicule, uh, both racial and gendered abuse. But she also got a lot out of that time, too. So one of the experiences that she does talk about was how being in Japan was just sort of a shock to what she assumed color could be, for example. Now, these are all the, the, the images that you see here are all mostly from standard postcards that you would get in a souvenir, uh, tourist shop. So images of Mount Fuji, images of temples, images of, and some were photographs she had taken herself. What she would do is then slice all of those images so that they almost looked like uh, little accordion ripples. And uh, she would then paste it on a hard board, but uh, she wouldn't paste them together. She would always just sort of leave a little interval and then repaint or fill in the image with paint herself. So what results was a really kind of staggered, rhythmic, uh, you know, very sort of almost unstable experience. Uh, Pendel sometimes talks about uh, uh, how is it that can you recreate the effects of living through an earthquake, where the ground that you stand on isn't, say, quite as stable or certain as you might expect. Uh, this is a work where it's not easy to say this is where it begins and this is where it ends. It's not a work that allows a space of rest. It's just constantly moving. To see it in person as well, it's... From the side, it's very, very uneven. It's almost like you're looking at a model of a physical landscape. Now, the last work that I did want to talk about today is a, um, a video by the Mumbai-based uh, collective studio camp. And it's called From Gulf to Gulf to Gulf. I'm bringing this up here because I thought it would be a uh, helpful bookend to some of the earliest early questions we talked about in terms of uh, water or movement, or how is it that the world itself is not about designating fixed places, but really about that constant sort of uh, uh, having to deal with, uh, uh, again, not necessarily securing yourself to one site or another. This is a, it's a single channel, channel digital video, which is just uh, fancy art speak for. There are two images, uh, well, sorry, there's one uh, image, it's sometimes parsed into two, it's about an hour and 20 minutes, so the same length as a, uh, many feature films. And it's com entirely comprised of footage that sailors took of themselves. So the journey starts in Gujarat, so on the western coast of India. And it starts with one group of sailors who then uh, sail to Sharjah. They start picking up uh, Pakistani and Irani uh, uh, boatmates. So you know, again, that in, in and of itself is quite a big, in some ways, a political transgression, given the state, again, given the stat, na national relationships between India and Pakistan. So one of the questions Studio Camp is very much interested in is how is it that artworks are allowed to exceed what it is that politics say, no, you can't be this, you can't do this, you can't associate with X, Y, and Z. The second is that because all the footage are taken by the seamen, you know, they're, they're not trained artists, and they're often using their phones. Um, sometimes I do get the question, you know, were they paid? Yes, they were actually paid very well. Uh, and uh, because they're t the seamen are taking, taking the foot footage themselves, it's, from the, it's, it's mobility from the bottom up. So in other words, it's not a top-down abstract, you know, bird's eye view. It's also really thinking about the tedium of moving from one part of the world to another. So as they move from India, they go to uh, the United Arab Emirates, and they finally uh, move to Somalia. So that's why the title from Gulf to Gulf to Gulf, uh, that, that's what it refers to. So I did want to show a short clip, um, just because it's you know, hard to uh, really get an idea of the work uh, just through verbal description alone. There was a video. Hmm, maybe the end didn't work. Sorry, did I, oh, there it is.
Actually, I mean, I'd love to just keep watching this, but it is 83 minutes, and I'm very conscious that some of you have other things to do. But um, just a, a few last takeaways is that, so all the images, these are all the points of view of all the men who are traveling on these boats that sometimes we think about them as, oh, it's means of transport or through the lens of, you'd say, global logistics. But uh, one of the sort of the questions here is that you have a lot of stillness, a lot of silence. You know, sometimes they're goofing around, enacting some scene from a song, and then others just moments of just waiting. So one of the sort of questions here is also, could we think about Afro-Asia through different uh, rates of time or different frequencies? That we have a world where, despite the, you know, the, the emphasis on globalization, that it actually is about unsettling that, homo that, that homogenous feel that the idea of the global can sometimes bring. So on that note, I'd like to end here. I thank you very much for your patience and your generosity and uh, I guess traveling with me through these images. And I'm always delighted to take questions. So thank you very much. through a historian telling view. So I think what I'm hearing you say is, to be more clear, is where do you draw the line between what is art and what is considered? This should be documentary news. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay. So a couple of things I think um, that your question is you know, getting at is, you know, one is how is it that, you know, in some ways anything is considered art in you know, this, this day and age. But what sort of different ki kinds of attention should we pay to different forms of you know, imagery or different works? And so one of, in, you know, in some ways, one of the interesting things that a lot of these artworks also do is ask us to pay a kind of attention that is becoming increasingly scarce. So one is we live in an age of social media. I mean, I think social media should be like high fructose corn syrup. Just, there should be laws regulating the use and access to it because what that has done is deteriorate the way in which one can take seriously you know, different kinds of objects or images. And so I think your question is also asking us to think about, is it even possible to get some of that capacity to pay serious attention to an image back? Is that even possible? That's one. And then the other also is, how is it that a particular you know, work, such as this, for example, can also be, or rather should be read through a different set of lenses that we just don't see this in the context of a museum. But what would it look like if we saw it as, say, on a television screen as part of you know, a larger uh, you know, news program? You know, would that also ch would that affect the way in which we thought about these images? Yes, but at the same time, could that also, is that also part of the attention? Because this work, it really kind of straddles that line between you know, the sort of uh, you know, durational video work we're so used to seeing. And you know, many museums like to keep you captive. I'm thinking about MoMA, where some of them are like two hours long. And I'm just thinking, I, I can't do this. I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, it's, I got to go. So one of the, I think one of the other questions you're also getting us to ask is that, well, maybe this, in fact, is intended for different kinds of viewing, that it's not just meant to be seen sort of in a large projection, which it usually is. But uh, you know, I've taught this in classes, and students 
find it interesting to toggle back and forth to from where they see it on their phones or laptops as part of, say, a larger kind of project in thinking about globalization versus when you see it in a darkened standalone space in a museum. So yes, thank you for reminding um, us that, uh, again, the idea of viewing too, like aphorasia, is not a settled question. So. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. It's been really amazing to kind of soak in these ideas. Um, my question for you is, as you're kind of toggling between these different ways of thinking about time and thinking about art, is there something that's come up in your research that's really surprised you about the connections that you've noticed between these different kinds of uh, ways of subverting these kind of Western mm. ideas of like what art is and like what these connections are. Mm. Um, so yeah, is there anything that you've come across that's like really surprised you or kind of made you like step back for a second? Um, I mean, like literally everything that I've encountered. <laughs> uh, but there are four things in particular. One is the degree to which these connections are not studied, which is so, um, and this, this is where I have to talk a little bit about biography. Um, so most of my life was spent either in Africa or Asia. My father worked for the World Bank. He was part of the Brandt Report. Uh, so this is the, the, the tension between sort of that, again, large scale idea of development versus what you see on the ground you know, is, is something I've been trying to reconcile. And one of the things that has always been very surprising is what is it that different parts of the world regard as important? So part of the way in which I approached this project is to, you know, if there was an artwork from a particular country I was interested in, I would go to that place and ask, you know, was it a professor who happened to be teaching art history, just cold call like a used car salesman. Sorry, no offense to used car salesmen in the audience. And say, can I sit in on your class? Because I wanted to hear what the students were most interested in. That really surprised me. So for, uh, for example, um, in South Africa, there was a particular class where the entire discussion was about universalism, which is a concept we don't like to talk about in the United States, at least in a lot of art history classrooms. We think of it as, oh, that's a, you know, it's an Enlightenment ideal. I'm like, I don't know. I, I like the Enlightenment. But uh, you know, it's, it's not something that's uh, you know, considered uh, current. But one of the questions that I was here just listening to students is that, why is it that it's not possible to think about Af universalism from an African viewpoint? Why is it that it's already considered passe in the so-called West when you know, that's a question that is still you know, continuing to operate in, you know, in uh, say, uh, you know, certain art worlds? Or say, in, um, you know, go to uh, you know, Korea, for example, and uh, you notice that uh, half the students are studying ink painting. You know, it's part of the art school curriculum. And so thinking about why isn't it that these kinds of centers of gravity, where certain parts of the world, what do they consider important? Why is that not written into the way we think about modern contemporary art that's supposed to be about global, about you know, difference, about inclusion? But the inclusion is quite limited in its conception. So actually going to places and just hearing what people are talking about. You know, not, no, I, don't, I don't really say anything. So again, I, uh, I'm just really you know, thinking about how, how is it that you can listen better has been very sort of eye-opening for me, too. Because you know, sometimes if you're in a classroom, you know, I teach at Michigan, and there are literally hundreds of pairs of eyes staring at me daily, which I really try not to think about. <laughs> And they expect you to know all the answers. And for me, that's, it's been very, very stressful. But to go to a different place and to realize you don't know anything, and that itself is a form of freedom. That, that's, and that, to me, has been extremely rewarding. Um, but in terms of some of the, uh, especially some of the pairings or some of the earlier works before the 20th century, that has been very interesting. So for example, the Duan Feng, the uh, ink rubbings of Egyptian uh, you know, monuments, even within Chinese art history, that isn't really studied at all. You know, most Chinese art historians don't know about you know, that because, again, it's think, thought of as peripheral simply because it happened in Africa. I think of Africa as not being central to Chinese art history. Or, say, um, the Howard Dina Pindell work. Uh, I remember when I first uh, uh, wanted to use that for my cover, and I had a very good friend who said, why would you put a minor Pindell as, as your cover? And for me, that was sort of like, ah, you know, 
we, you know, we, Howardina Pindell, wonderful artist, now, can, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, I guess she's part of the canon. But to say, to just assume that just because <clears throat> this is a work that she made in Japan and somehow not as relevant as some of her works that are overtly about the US political landscape is like, well, no, actually, the work she made in Japan is too also about the US political landscape. You know, it's all kind of integrated. And um, encountering some of the pushback, that was actually surprising to me because I, I, just, I just sort of, you know, I'm you know, naively expecting, oh, you know, this, this is something that, you know, would be, um, you know, more expansively received. But, um, yeah, that, but above all, kind of being a directed to artworks that other parts of the world or other communities found important, that was also very, um, <clears throat> just very eye-opening. So the portrait of um, uh, Don Miguel. So that was in a big uh, show called Afro-Atlantic Histories that uh, actually was at LACMA as well. I don't know if that portrait traveled. Uh, but that portrait is actually quite an object of veneration. You know, it almost has kind of an icon stat, sort of icon status. And so given that reception, how did that kind of force me to <clears throat> re reorient some of the assumptions we have about European portraiture? Because that too is very much part of that history of European portraiture, but it totally reorients it around a completely different set of you know, connections. That we often sometimes see black bodies only as you know, servants or as uh, you know, chains or enslaved. But you know, Don Miguel was not an exception. In fact, the Congo had already established a fairly substantial diplomatic relations that there were, again, he was not just kind of like a, the outlier. In fact, there were uh, you know, many envoys and emissaries. And how is it that portraiture allowed for that history to be disclosed and to surface? So, sorry, long answer. Thank you so much. Um, kind of bouncing off of uh, what Des had asked, you mentioned that negative space is active, and I loved that phrase. Um, and I've kind of been thinking about that in relation to other things that you've been talking about. I know there's so much that you weren't able to cover in your presentation that are in your book. What might your next book be about? I mean, well, the next book is about emojis. I hate, I hate to say it. Um, <laughs> this is something I got to get out of my system. You know, what, so. So emojis, I, I think um, pretty much everybody is familiar with it. Um, it's something I've been working on for a very long time, but it keeps becoming obsolete the moment I, uh, you know, finish like a rough draft. Uh, you know, emojis are very interesting because one, that too is also about how do you kind of get rid of the assumptions you might have about which emojis are popular or what it is, what do they actually mean? So different countries have different emojis that are popular. They use, it, they use different kinds of combinations. Um, part of that um, you know, project also you know, thinks about what sort of images actually become part of the, you know, the standard set. You know, foods, for example. You know, the taco is there, but for years. I've been trying to get the kimchi emoji accepted. <laughs> this is year nine, year nine, OK? This might be my year. So, you know, every year you, you, you write up a little proposal, it's six pages, and then you have to um, put a sample image. And in the proposal, you have to say, why was this, would this emoji have universal relevance, which is also why I'm interested in universalism. And I said, well, you know, millions of people eat kimchi. It's not just Koreans. I mean, it's just, you know, you go to LA, you know, again, it's everywhere. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, in, it's, it's in your tacos. It's, you know, it's in your, I don't know, maybe not breakfast cereal, but uh, you know, other things. And every year I got rejected, saying this is not relevant. And at first I thought it was my image because I had a very good um, a friend from, um, not from Seoul, from a different part of Korea. And she said, you know, this is, this is regionalist. This is discriminatory because you are, you are privileging the cabbage kimchi. You know, <laughs> you have to remember that in Korea there are more than 100 kinds of kimchi and different regions. You know, there's radish, you got cucumber, there's even pumpkin. And for you to just prioritize cabbage, you know, that, that itself is exclusionary. And I was thinking, you know what, you're right. So every year I, I try with a different image. I used to think it was my lack of technical drawing ability, but no, every year it says, this is too narrow. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I see like, you know, sushi is in there and, 
being also of, of Korean heritage, that you know, all my deep-seated nationalistic uh, anxieties kind of come to the surface and be like, I know that emojis were invented by a Japanese uh, uh, you know, designer, but you know, this is a little bit extreme. Uh, so part of that emoji book also talks about uh, that too, about how is it that even you know, these little images we don't think are substantial, you know, not having an image that you associate closely because of your background, you know, it, it, there, there's a certain kind of, you know, effective hurt. You know, it hurts, you know? I want to see kimchi in there one day, right? So, yes. But sorry, that's another long one, didn't answer. <laughs> Thank you for your time tonight. Um, my question is, I was curious if there's any other scholars that we should know about that talk about um, Afro-Asian connection. Maybe not so much the fine arts, just any arts in the art world that, um, that we should know about that you maybe introduced you to the idea of the Afro-Asian um, idea or um, yeah, just um, your Yeah, I mean, within visual, you know, surprisingly, there's not a lot written in visual art. Um, but maybe, you know, in other disciplines. Um, so there is a scholar named Kito Swan that wrote a book called Black Pacifica. And it was all about how is it that, say, um, and this is not art-related, uh, so the population of Papua New Guinea after 1973. So after Papua New Guinea wins its independence, they officially aligned themselves with black Africans, saying that, you know, that journey across oceans, you know, that binds you know, both peoples together. And it's, it's just, it's more, it's really a political history, but it's just something that also becomes a different kind of point of reference for thinking about some of these connections. Um, in terms of art, the work of Candace Williams. So Candace Williams uh, is very well known for her series of really kind of self-made publications. Uh, she has a press called Cassandra Press. And she, it, it's, not, this, it's not academic writing, but the associations that she makes, you know, this kind of, I think, gets at the spirit of what it is that Afro-Asia is trying to achieve as a political project is, again, to be able to make these connections despite perhaps uh, uh, it, uh, you know, institutional incentives not to make those connections, you know, to bring uh, you know, Bhutto dancers, for example, uh, with voguing. You know, just these kinds of, it's kind of almost like free association in a way. But how is it that that free association allows for the emergence of an unconscious that may have been kind of, you know, just kind of pushed to the sides? Um, in terms of uh, uh, cultural studies, there's a um, scholar named Tao Lee Goff who writes uh, really wonderfully about the Caribbean as an Afro-Asian site. Um, you know, she herself actually had a journey where she was trying to find her ancestors, uh, ancestral village in southern China and uh, also trying to find, uh, uh, look at, say, uh, her Jamaican ancestors as a way to you know, think about how is it that Afro-Asia is also about a time frame that exceeds you know, 20th, 19th, 18th, those kinds of uh, period markers that we're most used to. How do you think about the long term? Okay, so you know, centuries, maybe even millennia. So those are just some examples of uh, people whose work I love. So. Well, thank you so much, Join, for joining us um, this evening. We're so happy to have you, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. Great.